Last time, I showed how a city could power itself with renewable energy sources entirely within city limits. Now suppose you live there. All your energy comes from hydro, wind, and solar. But the sun just set, and there's no wind. Now what? Sure, your city has hydropower, but it's also connected to a grid that brings in surplus power from across the continent. Will these be enough to keep the lights on? And if they're not enough, how much energy will your city need to store? Could it just build giant versions of the batteries I used in my off-grid houses? Does the world even have enough lithium, copper, or lead to build giant batteries for every city? What other options are available? So many questions. Let's see if we can figure some of this out. And spoiler alert, we're going to chase down a bunch of blind alleys that are actually in use and seem to make sense before arriving at a blindingly obvious, better answer. Welcome to Edenicity, Best Practices for Sustainably Abundant Cities. Two episodes ago, I showed how we would need 450 kilowatt hours per person per month for housing, commercial buildings, and transportation, including intercity rail. If the U.S. went full Edenicity with 540 million people, we would need 330 gigawatts of electricity, about 63% of the electricity we use today. Even with a much bigger population, that's a big savings compared to today. But does it add up? In that same episode, I said our total energy demand would be 12% of what it is today, not 63%. What's going on? In the U.S., 80% of the energy we use is fossil fuels, and 20% is electricity. If Edenicity uses 63% of the 20%, that's 12% overall. So great, it works out. Edenicity both shrinks our demand and shifts nearly all of that demand to electricity. Of course, our demand will vary by time of day and from season to season. Here's how that looks for electricity now, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration. Notice that the demand peaks in the summer due to air conditioning and a little bit in the winter due to heating, which today is about 40% electric. And yes, most of it could use an efficiency upgrade. Going 100% electric increases the demand for electric heat by a factor of 2.5, but upgrading to efficient heat pumps divides that demand by a factor of 3 to 4. So at the very least, the winter peak won't be bigger with Edenicity, and the summer peak may shrink too. The other upgrades, insulation and increased tree cover, would also tend to flatten the seasonal and daily variation. But just to be conservative, I took this curve and multiplied it by 63%, to get the seasonal curve for Edenicity. Same shape, less demand. Zooming in, you can see how energy demand varies throughout the day. That's pretty easy to understand. We use less energy when we are asleep and more when we're awake. Here's where most of that energy comes from, mostly fossil fuels. Notice that there's a baseline of nuclear power. It changes only gradually. The renewables are those blue, yellow, and green wiggles at the top. Solar and wind power change throughout the day. Demand changes throughout the day. So it's pretty easy to have a gap between demand and supply. To fill the gap, fossil fuels and, as we'll see later, hydromechanical power are throttled slightly throughout the day. Now what happens if we remove the fossil fuels and the nuclear power? That leaves those wiggly renewables, hydro in blue, solar in yellow, wind in purple. I've kept their shape, but rescaled them for Edenicity. The purple line is demand. This is for January 2023. It's still chaotic, so let's zoom in. Demand in black this time. During the day, there's a lot more energy supply than demand. At night, there's slightly more demand than supply. No problem, it's not a big difference. Now you may be asking yourself, couldn't we just use less hydro during the day and a little more at night? In fact, that's already happening. Here's the solar and the hydro through the month. And when we zoom in, you can see that as solar declines late in the day, hydro ramps up to fill the gap through the evening. Well, couldn't we throttle that hydro just a little bit more? After all, it's not a big gap. Well, here's the hydro by itself, and you can see that it's already throttled a lot in January. There are physical limits to how much you can throttle existing hydro, river flow, reservoir capacity, size, and the number of generators. And this was the easy scenario. Here's the data for July. The demand is a lot more bouncy, and so is the supply. The gaps are bigger. It's more extreme overall. Let's plot hourly supply minus demand for July. Oversupply on top, shortfalls on the bottom. The good news is there's twice as much oversupply as there are shortfalls. We have all the energy we need every day. This is true throughout the year. But look at the size of those shortfalls. They peak at 200 watts per person at night. Now compare those shortfalls to the total hydro available. Notice how much the hydro is already throttled. It's pretty extreme. 
Our daily energy shortfalls are more than the baseline, so existing hydro probably won't be able to fill the gap. How big is that gap? About a third of the daily demand. Couldn't we just buy energy from the grid to fill the gap? Actually, that's already built into this model because it uses complete data from all 48 contiguous states. Some places will be lucky enough to fill the gaps with geothermal or hydrothermal power, but most won't. In Edenicity Phase 2, when all industry is optimized for recycling and renewables, we'll have maybe another 60 watts per person of biofuels. If we only burned that at night, we could almost close the gaps. But that would leave basically nothing for industry. And yes, better landscaping, insulation, and heat pumps would flatten the daily demand curve. Even smarter thermostats would help. In Los Angeles, for example, I used to run the air conditioner from 11 a.m. until about 4 or 5 p.m. in July. I could get away with that because it's a dry climate that cools off rapidly at night. But a good chunk of the U.S. lives in places like Ohio, where summers are humid and that sticky heat can stay with you past midnight. I lived without air conditioning in my tiny houses, but I know most people in cities would never choose that. So it's very likely that Edenicity would need to store at least some energy for those hot nights. How much? Something like a sixth of a day during the hottest days of summer, or about 13 gigawatt hours per city per day. Here's where this story gets crazy. But first, be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already, so you don't miss any more deep dives like this. When you think of energy storage, you probably think of batteries. That's what I did in Season 1, when for simplicity I pictured Edenicity as 100% solar powered. This made sense to me because the tiny houses that I built were entirely solar powered. For energy storage, I used lead acid batteries. These were the least expensive, most reliable, most recyclable option at the time. The batteries in this house had a capacity of 5 kilowatt hours. I used about 1 and a quarter kilowatt hours a day, 42 times less energy than the average US household, a tenth as much as an Edenicity apartment. It was fun for me, but I don't recommend it. What was it like to live there? I'll be glad to share that in a separate, exclusive video for the Edenicity membership that we'll be launching soon. Watch for the announcement. My tiny house had 500 watts of solar panels. These could recharge the batteries in half a day. A battery's lifetime depends on how deeply you drain it every day. This is called the depth of discharge. In my case, with a 25% depth of discharge, the batteries should last 4,000 cycles or about 11 years. If I had designed the system with a 50% depth of discharge, the battery life would drop to 5 years. What happens then? The lead gets recycled. I'll have a lot more to say about that in a moment. Anyway, the point is, my battery bank stored enough energy for several days of normal use. But the question is, could this scale? This is a major theme with Edenicity. There's a huge disconnect between the solar punk lifestyle that I lived and what works for a city let alone an entire civilization. Here's what I mean. An Alert Season 1 podcast listener sent me a link to this blog post about large-scale battery storage. It was from Tom Murphy's Do the Math blog in 2011, when renewable energy was just taking off and lead-acid batteries were the most economical energy storage available. Murphy asked the non-obvious question, is there enough lead in the whole world to store even just the energy the U.S. needs for renewables? His result? The U.S. alone would need 5 billion tons of lead, 62 times more than all the known reserves in the world. Lead is scarce. Who knew? But Murphy was working with status quo energy use. Sure, he took a third off as a reward for electrifying everything. Fossil fuels do lose a lot of energy to heat in engines. But Edenicity cuts even Murphy's demand estimate by another factor of five through good urban design, as I described in this episode. He also assumed seven days of energy storage, we're assuming one-sixth of a day. That's another factor of 42. Bottom line, on the Edenicity plan, the U.S. would need only 30% of the world's lead reserves. But there's a problem. Even a fully Edenized U.S. with 540 million people accounts for just 5% of the world's projected peak population. So the world's lead reserves are still five times too small. Okay, there's another problem too. Lead is a horrible neurotoxin. Sure, it gets recycled, 99% of it, according to industry groups, or 60% to 80% according to the Environmental Protection Agency. Even then, lead recycling is considered the most polluting industry on Earth. UNICEF says a third of the children in the world, some 800 million, have toxic levels of lead in their bodies today. This is linked to mental health problems, impulsive criminal behavior, kidney and cardiovascular disease. Lead is nasty stuff. Okay, so what about other types of batteries? 
Well, lithium ion is the most common and economical choice today. I did the math and it looks like there's enough lithium in use and in reserves to do the job for the whole world, but not quite enough nickel. And lithium ion batteries aren't made for recycling, so this is not a long-term solution. There are non-toxic nickel iron batteries that last up to 50 years. These are the batteries patented in 1901 by Thomas Edison that you'll still find in modern New York subway trains. But when I duplicate Murphy's calculations for these batteries, I find that even on the Edenicity plan, the world would need 1.2 billion tons of nickel, three times all the known nickel reserves and ores on the planet. Okay, what else is available that would use more common materials? Thermal energy storage uses excess electrical power to heat up rock, concrete, or other inert material in an insulated container. If you run steam pipes through it and out to a generator, you can produce electricity when you need it. These systems are far cheaper than lithium ion. They're built to operate at least 25 to 50 years, much longer than lithium ion, and the materials are inert and generally recyclable. How long they store energy depends on their size and insulation. A shipping container-sized thermal battery typically loses about 2% a day. An Edenicity village would need 12 shipping containers to cover its summer energy shortfalls. The efficiency of electricity to heat to electricity systems is only about 40%. That cuts it a little close because our excess each day peaked at around 400 kilowatt hours and our shortfall each night was around 150 kilowatt hours. At 40% efficiency, this wouldn't leave much margin. Also, these systems aren't great at storing energy for more than a few days. Worse, I haven't analyzed multiple years, but it stands to reason that there could well be years where weeks or months go by that accumulate just a little energy deficit every night. Then things get a little bleak. Power gets scarce and expensive. Economic inequality deepens because sweating out a heat wave to make ends meet takes a toll on a person's health and their ability to work. It's not just about the individual. It's also about the health of any vulnerable family members who may need their help at the expense of going to work. Should we have better safety nets? Of course. But they are no substitute for better urban design. We really need a more efficient way to store energy for longer periods of time. Bonus points if it's really durable and doesn't use a lot of toxic material. Fortunately, in many places it's possible to build high reservoirs and pump water up to them for energy storage. Then, when you need that energy, you simply drain the upper reservoir through a generator back to a lower reservoir. Pumped hydro energy storage has been used for over a century. These facilities can easily last a century with minimal maintenance, and they don't involve large amounts of scarce or toxic materials. Pumped hydro is 90% efficient each way, or 80% overall, so it stores twice as much of that daytime energy. It can store energy for weeks or months, and it throttles really well, providing power nearly instantly when we need it. Viewers have voiced concerns about damming more rivers. Fortunately, a global survey in 2021 found hundreds of thousands of good locations for off-river pumped hydro. See the link in the description. These sites don't interfere with flowing rivers because they simply transfer water between high and low reservoirs. In some cases, the reservoirs already exist or involve abandoned mine sites. Pumped hydro makes use of the potential energy difference between high and low reservoirs. If that elevation difference is high, off-river systems can be much smaller than the flooded areas behind dams of similar power. That vastly reduces their environmental impact. Pumped hydro is designed to store a full day of energy use, so it's still big, about 2 square meters per person or 11 square kilometers in the Edenicity reference design. See the link in the description. That works out to 1 13th of each of the industrial zones in that design. That's great news because even though hydro storage is big, it still easily fits within city limits. The bad news for me here in Ohio is that there aren't any good locations for pumped hydro. But all those good locations in that 2021 land survey added up to 150 times more energy storage than any projected global demand, 220 times more than Edenicity would demand. That capacity is available in the hills and mountains of every continent, and we would need about half a percent of it. Developing pumped hydro systems would add about 4% to the cost of solar and wind. With a good power grid, it would be available to Edenicity everywhere as it grows. In Phase 1, cities with Edenicity plans start building transit-oriented, food-secure, energy-secure buildings, blocks, and villages. As these grow and merge to become towns, they're consuming far less energy, less electricity, and meeting more of their needs on-site with renewable energy. Cities like Columbus, where pumped hydro is not an option, export their power to the grid and buy power back when they need it. 
Cities with pumped hydro build extra capacity so they can import power during the day and export it at night. At some point, fossil and nuclear energy will be such a small part of the mix that it won't make sense to use them anymore. With good city design, we'll need eight times less renewable energy to make this transition, so it can happen that much sooner. What this means is it's really time to push for public transit, bike lanes, urban farming, and multifamily housing with no parking minimums, and to question tax policies that subsidize cars and suburbs. These are the levers that will massively speed the transition to renewable energy. I am planning an episode on phase two of Edenicity where we Edenize all industry, shipping, and air travel, but I've decided to postpone it because of some travel I have later this week. I'm really excited about it, and I plan to take a couple of episodes worth of video. You can get all the details in the next newsletter, which will have a reply button to send in your questions. To subscribe, see the link in the description. Thanks for watching, liking, and subscribing. Take care, stay green, see you next time.